Change may be the only constant in life, but its pace is rapidly accelerating. Managing all this change and ambiguity is a trillion dollar headache for leaders and businesses. Karen Fuster is my guest today, and her perspective on managing change is both unique and highly effective. We chat about key challenges faced by leaders and companies, the major factors missed by most organizational change management initiatives, and what leaders can do to embrace the opportunities that ambiguity and change actually present. So keep listening, it's gonna be awesome. Welcome to the Working Well Podcast, the show that explores the rapidly changing landscape of work and well being. Each episode, we dive into the hottest topics in leadership, employee well being, and the future of work. I'm your host, Tim Boris. Before we get started, let's learn a little bit more about Karen. Karen Fuster is a renowned entrepreneur, executive coach, and consultant specializing in helping leaders and companies thrive through transition and transformation. Her emphasis is on strategy development and implementing effective solutions that minimize the people and operational impacts associated with major change. Right, Karen, wonderful to have you on the show. I know we were chatting a little bit beforehand and we've got a great topic today to to discuss, but before we dive in, how have you been? What's, uh, What's new in Brisbane? Well, I have been fabulous. It's always good because the sun's really starting to come out uh, in this hemisphere, this part of the world, and the warmth is beautiful. I just think people in general are in a better mood when the sun's out, the sky's blue, and we can be outdoors. So, And we're getting closer to Christmas. I know we're a little way off yet, but it feels like it's um, not too far around the bend. So it's beach time in Australia, and that's always good times. Perfect. Well, great to hear. And this this topic that we're going to dive into on ambiguity, uh, strategy, uh, change management, there's a, a lot of nuances to it. And you know, you're an expert in the field. And after reading some of your information, I'm so intrigued to hear what you have to say and your take on a lot of the challenges that companies are facing these days. And so I guess the, the big question is, why do, well, change is constant, but why do organizations fail so common or rapidly and often at, uh, at this change process? Look, it's the million-dollar question, to be honest, and I believe that it's because we underestimate the human side of change. So you are right, change is constant and we've been doing it forever. And as, as the individual, we're not too bad at it. We've evolved, we've learned, we've grown, we've developed, and that's what we continue to do. However, change itself has got all the complexities of emotions, all the complexities of what what does this mean for me? And what we try to do is often put together a good looking plan that takes us from A to B to C to D, which we can do. What we actually fail to really take into consideration to the depth we need to is what is the impact on the individual and the person. That's what happens at the end of the day. So, yes, we can implement a new system. Yes, we can relocate, you know, an organisation of 500 people from building one to building two. Whatever that change may be, we can merge, we can demerge. All of that happens, but ultimately no change is effective unless we've got the people, their hearts and their minds coming along as well. And that's the, that can be messy and a bit ugly and a bit difficult. And so I think we tend to go, let's just keep on moving through and manage the process change or the system change. But, of course, it doesn't really stick unless the people are using the process and the system. I, I love that you brought up the, the process aspect because when you look at especially change management theory, methodology, there's like you've got all these steps and there's these nice models and you know, the people with the those that education and like, yes, we've got the system to do. But when you said is the people part of it has to be there. And when people are too focused on the process, the people get lost in, and, mm. and I guess how, what that impact on people is. And that, that takes me back to that saying is like everything I need to know. I learned in kindergarten. <laughs> it's like, the, <laughs> it's not rocket science that oh, hey, I'm just going to impact people. <laughs> And let's listen to people. 
Uh, look, that's exactly it. And I think, look, largely people do understand that change is about people, but the effort and the action required to really get people to come along, it is significant and we can't brush over it. And the thing about change is it is an emotional process, whether it's good change or bad change. So, for example, if you even think about, you know, if somebody is engaged to be married and you assume that they're making this informed choice and that they're happy about that, and that is a change, there is still a grieving process of the life that they had. It's different now, even though they're the one who's saying, let's go forward and this is the change I want. We still have a loss of some description. When change happens in a workplace, people often feel like it's being done to them rather than with them. And so that engagement of making sure, you know, that we're asking the questions, we're taking the time to hear their input, we're being incredibly inclusive and really understanding what other people want and what they see, what they need, what they think the best outcome will be. Sometimes we just race through that because time is precious and the system has to be put in place or the business case is is ready to be delivered or the budget envelope says we've only got this amount so that's how we're allocating it and all of those factors are true i'm not dismissing any of them i guess i'm saying that we we can't um we can't make a choice where the human side of change comes second all the time it has to at least be parallel because otherwise it won't it won't be embedded to the degree that you want you won't get the returns yeah well well said and i think a lot of that comes back to trust like Mm -hmm. trust in the organization and you can make change happen quickly and even at some point uh, not necessarily connect the the human part of the change but if you've built a lot of trust previously you have that bandwidth to work with. And I've seen companies make rapid change and do it well, but because I think it's because they have that trust built up in ahead of time. So they are able to get people on board faster and they understand the impact on, on that. Absolutely. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Without the trust as the foundation. In anything, by the way, in the workplace, you're always up against additional challenge and potential barriers. Having uh, the trust, which is if I say I'm going to do this, I will do this, and if something changes, I will let you know, that speaks volumes for people because I'm not sitting around thinking about what's really going on, why aren't they being transparent, you know, I'm not racing to the water cooler or, you know, via the Zoom water cooler to say, what have you heard, what did you say? So our you know, our spider senses can settle down a bit. We're not looking for what's going to go wrong because we, we have got that trust and we understand that the change can be difficult, but the change is necessary for the betterment of the business or the industry, individuals, whatever that, whatever the driver, the why behind the change. If that's clear and I trust the person who's telling me that and I trust that I'll be kept informed, then it's, it's a significantly easier pathway. And as I was saying before, if we've got the map to show what the change looks like and I'm being kept informed and I can see progress, I tend to be more comfortable. The challenge I think we have increasingly now, and you mentioned it earlier, is it's not just pure change. The pace of our change is significant. The complexity of change um, it just continues to grow deeper And therefore, this is really what ambiguity is. We are faced with that overall level of uncertainty. We're in an unfamiliar environment. So many new pieces of data being presented to us at pace that we don't yet know how to utilise. There's a whole lot of, and this is, it feels sometimes really quite chaotic and that, that fog around you, which is I can't see clearly. And so that's when trust is even more paramount because if I'm feeling overwhelmed, scared, um, exposed, worried, I really, really want to hook into someone who is a bit more solid for me that will help me find the way forward. And I don't mean it has to be a one-on-one relationship all the way, but if you've got that leader who's got that, that capacity to have connected with people and that they are the face and they're the voice of the change, it really helps to clear the path through the fog of all of that ambiguity. But I love how you use the word ambiguity as well, because that is 
not a it's not a word you hear often in the corporate context, but it's so relevant to what is happening. This change is increasing rapidly, but you can have change that's happening, but see the outcome and have a clear vision of the outcome. So it's not as, I guess, stressful or Mm -hmm. impactful. Whereas when you change is happening all around you and you can't see what's going to happen, you can't fathom it, or you think this is going to happen and something different happens Mm -hmm. that that's something I think that's missing a lot in the, the discussions that are happening in organizations about how do we deal with that not knowing what the future is going to look like. And the five-year plan we put together is blown out of the water three months down the road. What, what skills do leaders and people need to build to, I guess, be more comfortable with that, to embrace ambiguity? Absolutely. And, and the way you've described it is really why we started to get involved in research and understanding more about what actually happens to us when we're in that state of ambiguity. We need to, there's, there's multiple skills. First and foremost, if you look at, and the research that we've undertaken with the university here in Queensland, Australia, uh, Queensland University of Technology, the key finding in terms of the skill most highly correlated to being able to perform during ambiguity and maintaining your well-being during a a really ambiguous phase is mindfulness, which is really interesting in itself because although increasingly we do hear a lot of that word in the corporate sector, the practice of it still is a little loose, like really, how is this going to help anything? But fundamentally, if you can still your mind, take away some of the noise that, that ambiguity absolutely creates, some of that chaos, some of the panic, some of the room among green, all of those um, aspects which are trying to take control of our, of our thinking, if we can still our mind and focus on what's happening right here, right now, being very, very present and focused, it enables us to work out what's the first step I can take. Because being decisive in a highly ambiguous environment is, is really fundamental. Standing around and waiting for clarity it will trip people up all the time because that might happen in change, but it infrequently happens in ambiguity. We have to find the way forward. And therefore that takes me to another skill, which is courage. It takes a lot of courage to take a step forward when, as you say, I actually don't know what the outcome is, or I thought we were going down this path and suddenly I'm going this path. And I don't even like that path. I don't know why I'm on that path. And so being able to take that step forward so you don't get stuck is really critical. I think that builds into the trust that we talked about earlier, trust in yourself, but also trust in the vision that you've set, the people you have around you and supporting you as a team. There's a lot of that missing these days from what I've seen in in companies. And the more I've seen leaders just go inward and close themselves off, I think it just makes, it's a spiral effect across the organization that makes ambiguity greater degrades trust and then makes the change management process that much more difficult hmm? i i love your perspective i think it's uh it's good so as we're talking about that you obviously are doing things a bit differently than called the general change management industry. What have you seen, what types of changes have you seen over the past few years, particularly since the start of COVID? In terms of the change management industry? Yeah, and and how change management is is evolving. Sure, sure. Look, I think that there's a a really uh, healthy level of appreciation that if we don't have the skill of adaptability, then we are becoming potentially irrelevant in the workplace. And I know that sounds tough, but if you're not able to adapt to the um, the, the pace of change in an organisation, you will get left behind. I also think there's a greater appreciation that we don't, we certainly don't have the five-year plan. We have the line on the hill that we're hoping to get to. And I think there's uh, acknowledgement that having a really um, detailed plan is something of the past. What we need to do is have the skill 
to plan for when for when things um, move in a direction we didn't ex- expect them to, but being wedded to a plan can be really problematic. So I think that that level of agility and flexibility around let's let's put together some you know indicative milestones and deliverables and dates that we're aiming to get to because we need some structure humans are better when we have a routine and we know what we're supposed to do and when we're when we're expected to do it the key however is that plan is not chiseled in concrete it is very much written in pencil so we can rub it out as we go and say we thought that was going to happen it's not right or it didn't work out how we hoped it would, so we need to adapt and change. So I do think there's a greater appreciation of that. There's also recognition that, and, you know, you mentioned COVID, there's been no no better experiment in the world in terms of looking at how, how do we respond under pressure. And that was everything about ambiguity was the pandemic. We had no idea what it meant we were frightened for our own health, our well-being, those who we love. We can't go to work. My routine is totally gone. I don't even know how to use this thing called Zoom or Teams or whatever I might have been. So the requirement to learn was significant. And therefore, we felt out of our depth. And when you're in that place, you, you again have some choices. Am I going to sit here and let this happen to me and wash over me? Or am I going to find my one way to take a step forward? And that might have been tidying out a room and kicking the kids out and setting up your office in their playroom, whatever it might have been. But we had to continually take steps to create a way forward. I actually think one of the, and and I have clients where this has happened, you know, the learnings in the pandemic, I think are the, the richest. It's like a free MBA And those who didn't learn there, I want to feel sad for. But secondly, you know, we're race, I think we're not holding on to the learnings well enough. Certainly here in Australia, there is an increasing um, expectation of full return to work. And so hybrid is becoming less, less of a, a way. It still certainly exists. But I think the negotiation skill that the employee had in terms of I can work anywhere, so hybrid is an effective way of operating. Given the cost of living and the global economic situations, I think that the relationship power has shifted a little bit and if an employer wants an employee back in the workplace, they seem to have a little bit more um, a little bit more pull that that's actually how we're going to operate moving forward. And I, I actually think that's potentially a loss of one of the key learnings of the benefit of flexibility and hiring talent from anywhere around the world because the right person could be sitting here in Brisbane, in Canada, in Budapest. We don't know. But if, we, if we're if we looking at five days a week sitting in an office, then I think we, we lose the richness of the global talent. I agree wholeheartedly. I just had a great conversation on actually a previous podcast uh, that just got released today about uh, that uh, software entrepreneur who had his company was all in person up until right before COVID. And they started experimenting with a little bit. And then people think, oh, software, you can do it all over the place. But that was his company was bricks and mortar up until that Mm -hmm. point. And he went through it himself. And he's like, I would never go back now. It's we're attracting talent from all over the world and amazing people. And any talk of bringing people back to the office is met with like, why would you do it? We don't need to. We've thrived over the past few years because we've set the systems and structures and helped our leaders adapt to how to communicate and how to engage people in a remote environment. Mm -hmm. And it can be done. But I think, as you said, there's a lot of leaders that are not seeing that opportunity they're trying to stick to the what worked before and not adapting to to change i i agree with you and you know there's a really strong argument and and i totally agree that us humans are better when we connect you know we're a tribal um tribal mob and we do like to to be connected 
there's different ways we can connect so that we're not excluding. So if you even think about, if I, if I think about in Australia, you know, we've, we essentially um, as a nation live on the coast, but we're an enormous country and there is a lot of, a lot of other talent that sort of, even if it's only a hundred kilometers inland, they're not going to be able to get on in a car. Well, I could every day and commute. What does that do for a person? Yet they might be able to really contribute something quite significant that because they choose to live, you know, near the mountains or wherever they might be, does that mean that they cannot be included? And and I think that in itself creates another challenge. So having a way that we do connect as humans, coming together for, you know, um, milestone events or, you know, social activities, or even having that hybrid where it is a balance so that the culture, uh, we don't lose the, the culture. I, I do think that's important. And I also think it's important to say that a way of working is our cultures can also be inclusive of remote working and hybrid working because it just provides a, a better level of inclusivity. And so I'm I'm all about that. You know, you and I are sitting uh, in opposite hemispheres at, uh, you know, I'm at the beginning of my day, you'll be at the end of the night, of the day before, we're having an easy conversation and we're not prevented from doing that because of where we live. And and I think that that's the case everywhere, that we we, we continually need to look at how do we be inclusive regardless of where people um, choose to lay their heads. Yeah, and for the record, I would love to go to Brisbane and, and work there. <laughs> and I'll have it hit that way. <laughs> especially at this time of year in, in Calgary. When the weather's getting colder, although it is ski season coming up. So we. It's not all bad. The skiing in Brisbane is not near as good as it is in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when you're working with leaders and companies, how do you, well, I guess, yeah, how do you help them? see that bigger picture perspective and to understand the uh, opportunity versus a threat. How do you get them to embrace that ambiguity and use it as an advantage? I, I love that question. Um, if I can just tell a, a brief story, we were working with a tertiary organisation here in Australia and we were looking at so much uncertainty. And this is probably just towards the back end of the pandemic when students were no longer coming to the campuses. You know, there were significant channels to learning and you didn't really need to come in with your books and listen to a lecturer, you know, sitting in a room, et cetera. And also the global market was shut down. Uh, certainly we, we, we have a strong uh, international uh, student base here in Australia and that was closed down obviously during the pandemic. So from a pure commercial perspective, the tertiary sector really struggled here in Australia and most likely globally, I'm assuming. What we were working with the, um, the, the team about, we were looking at all of the uncertainties, at all of the ambiguity. And because there's a fairly traditional way of education is a fairly traditional industry, um, so I, I think has always been and, and there's room for so a little bit of change there in that industry, another story. But because they're relatively traditional, I, it, they were quite stuck in terms of trying to look at different ways of doing things or trying to be creative to solve these new problems. And so we looked at the, you know, really commonly understood terminology of VUCA. So what's volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous? What are some of those factors that are impacting the industry at the moment? And then we said, why don't you flip it? Every other tertiary sector in this country is a tertiary organisation, sorry, in this country is also experiencing that. Imagine if you were the ones to say, and what's the advantage from this situation? Because by just continually looking at these, the challenges, these, the problems, there's so much uncertainty, we can't resolve this. How do we make a decision? Haven't seen this problem before. That is all a fact. And then there's the opportunity to say, and so how do we look at this through the lens of what opportunities does this present for our industry or our role in this industry? And I I think it's just, there's very, very few industries that are not going through significant 
beyond change, upheaval, whether it's consolidation, whether it's, you know, we've certainly had um, when you have a Royal Commission investigation into, you know, whether the governance is appropriate in a certain industry or whether the cultures um, are operating as one would expect when there's an investigation and you identify that there's gaps in the way that we've been operating for some time, what that means is we just necessarily have to improve and change. And so rather than looking at it as an audit list that, you know, is is longer than you can possibly leap over of all the problems, what's the benefit of actually implementing something positive and doing it differently? And so we help people by understanding initially as an individual, what is your tolerance level of ambiguity? How do you respond when you feel overwhelmed, that that gush of uncertainty um, hits you in the face? And we have an assessment that we have developed with Queensland University of Technology to measure that your individual levels and also your team's, um, your level of tolerance. And that just is a starting point. Data is really useful when people have some insights most people think they're probably more efficient, more effective, um, more proactive about uh, ambiguity than what they actually are. At the end of the day, we give people some data, we help them understand what does this mean for me, and then we just start to work with them in terms of how can we think differently about this problem? How do you need to focus in this particular area to make sure that you're going to resolve something today, not just sit in it and go, It's another day of uncertainty. Absolutely, it's a day of uncertainty. But where could you get some clarity today as a result of focusing on something nice and tight? So we are constantly looking at ambiguity, change, their facts. Humans aren't built to love them. But the fact of the matter is humans are pretty extraordinary. And if we make a choice to look at this from a positive perspective, then really the world's your oyster. You can do things incredibly differently and take advantage. Love that. And that actually aligns quite closely with uh, the model or philosophy I use in the coaching is that that mindset shift has to happen first is logically you can say, yes, I get this, but then there's those emotions behind it, the feelings, the you know, subconscious talk that's happening. And mm-hmm. how do you balance that out because the more you try and push that logical change without managing the mindset shift that's going to enable that it makes it that much much more that much more difficult for Mm. people to embrace that well ambiguity but also the change process itself it does and we've got that little voice in our brain screaming at us and saying get away from this this change and this ambiguity, it is not good for you. It's not healthy for you. And so the fear is is very, very real. It's not a made up thing and it's not a weakness and it's not a failure. It's giving us a message. The challenge is that the, the fear is normally beyond what the potential impact is of this uncertainty. So what we need to be able to do is understand, recognize I'm, I am currently feeling frightened or overwhelmed because of the degree of uncertainty. That is a fact. That is how I'm feeling. Okay, so what is one thing I can do to sort of settle that down a little bit? I need a bit of clarity. Okay, how do I find the clarity? What question can I ask? What document can I read? Which person can I connect with? Um, You know, how do I keep myself informed so I'm not a victim of all this uncertainty and ambiguity? I'm actually taking some accountability and stepping into it. You're right, though. I need my voice to stop screaming at me for a moment so I can see clearly. And so one of the things that I like to use with my coaching clients is listen to the voice, write down what's it telling you, and then go through a really simple exercise of is that a fact or is that a story? Is it a fact that you're going to be unable to operate in this new world? Is it the fact that you um, don't have the skills, uh, the people are talking about you, that you'll be left behind? Is there any evidence that that's true or is that just this voice? And if it's not true, park it on, put it on the other column and let's deal with what we can actually tackle. And that I think helps people as well because it brings a bit of clarity for them. Yeah, and, and I've already 
vision lots of leaders that you probably work with being like, this sounds too touchy feely to me, this whole like <laughs> mindset, mindfulness, uh, feelings side. How do you manage that perception in this process to bring on what we call maybe old school leaders or people that are uncomfortable with that discussing feelings aspect of sure, leadership? Sure. Mm, I've met one or two. So um, do you know what I often do, Tim, is I will find out more about the human, the person. Are you a mum or a dad? Are you an auntie or an uncle or a brother or a sister? Some way that there's a connection. Who Who is somebody in this workplace that you have recruited and you've really helped to develop you know you've you've coached you've led them etc so I want to I look for that human connection and then I simply ask them what advice would you give your 15 year old daughter at the moment or your 22 year old cousin what would you say to them because we know it's very very true that we're much kinder to those that we love rather than being kind to ourselves and so if you're offering that advice to those people which part of that advice might apply for you right now. And it's just to get them to a position of understanding that uh, we basically are made up of emotions and they're they're great. They're, They're there to warn us. They're there to encourage us. They are who we are. By trying to suppress them, it's one, it's, I believe it's impossible and exhausting. And But people, generally speaking, can more readily and more easily speak about somebody else, particularly someone who they care about or, you know, who they love. Also, most people choose kindness. So I also ask them, if you you could be as kind as you possibly could to yourself right now, what advice would you give yourself? And people might say, give yourself a break. Just, you know, take it easy for a little while or remind yourself that, You're sitting at this table, this executive table, because you belong here. They will find a way as opposed to me saying, I know you're feeling frightened and overwhelmed because that, even though that may be true, sometimes that is too big a language for people and I feel like, oh, hang on, you're saying I'm weak because unfortunately that's still seen as a weakness um, for some people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you're human and so be kind to yourself so you can then ideally find some clarity, speak a little bit more clearly and feel a bit calmer so you can take that first step forward. I love that. Yeah. And one thing I you brought up that I think a lot of people miss is the, we'll call it touchy feel if you want, but this emotion-based uh, emotional intelligence, positive intelligence, that doesn't necessarily mean low performance. In fact, it's connect intricately tied to high performance, being able to tap into that, recognizing that we're humans and that we have emotions and that we want to connect with people. As you said at the beginning, the human side of change management often gets forgotten. And that is really understanding that we are human and that there's a something we have to address there in order to make sure our performance is high and we're able to accomplish what we want. And, and that's, I think there's, especially in the call it the old school leaders, there's that mindset that, Ooh, that's going to take away from the objectives we're trying to reach. And from what I hear you saying, it's absolutely not. Yeah. You know, just this week I was coaching an executive, a CEO who was speaking about, his team of high performers, and I asked him to describe why they were high performers. Every single one of those that he spoke about was in terms of their task, their deliverable, their plan that they work on. And I asked about how they develop others, you know, how they collectively come together as a team to problem solve, how they're trying, because this organisation is trying to have a positive impact on the broader industry, how do you do that as, as you know, as a high-performing team? Um, how do you test and challenge each other so you're not going down a rabbit hole and then being really belligerent and saying, I've always done it this way and it's the right way? It was very interesting because he, and this is what I love about coaching and I'm sure you do as well, when someone has an aha moment and they literally say, oh, okay, that's an interesting way to look at it. 
they're, they're not mutually exclusive. They can't be. How are you a high performer in terms of delivering an outcome if you haven't brought people along with you, if you haven't engaged your stakeholders, if you haven't actually listened to what your customer, your member, your student wants that you you have to have that human element of, of performance. Otherwise, it's purely delivering on task and task is important and that's more about the management aspect of our ways of working. If we're talking about leadership, it has to include engagement, listening, communication, uh, connection, belonging, curiosity, creativity, all of those things that we have and they're innate to us. And somewhere along the way, we squash them. There's somewhere in our education system, it gets, you know, reduced. I do think it's changing. I absolutely think it's different um, that that we are welcoming all of that positive ways of thinking and encouraging people to have their voice in that way. And you've referenced a few times some of the old school leaders, and absolutely they exist. And absolutely there's industries that are still focused um, fundamentally on task delivery over that focus on leadership and bringing people along as well. They're not one without the other. There's no point in having a fantastic person who's fun and engaging and clever and curious who can't deliver anything. They're kind of your friend. That's great. Cheers. I'll I'll hang out with you. We don't want to necessarily have you in our team, though, because we need to get things done. But they're not one without the other. They absolutely, um, when you get them hand in glove, that's when I believe you get the absolute high performance. Absolutely. Yeah. And and there are lots of ways to accomplish a task. Some of those set you up for long-term success and build a great culture and build a a great team and a flywheel that will produce great results over the long-term. Other ones tear it down. So you have a couple of people that are just pushing, hammering through results by ripping everyone else apart (laughs) and to, to use fairly blunt words, but I've seen it happen in organizations. You get those high performers, quote, that uh, put up great numbers, but there's a wake of destruction in their their path, turnover rates in the organization, engagement rates, uh, you know, lack of trust, all those things that, that happen. And it's extraordinary. And I think it's easier to see those people now because you do see the, uh, you know, the, devastation I leave behind. And I think that there's some some certain industries and there's functions where we think, oh, we just need to tolerate this for a while because, gosh, they are delivering that really complex, difficult project. They're the first, you know, project manager or program lead that's come in and delivered that, that complexity on time and on budget. But, again, d- delivering a, a, a new system or a change on time and on budget but with people being stepped on all the way through it um, or the loss of talent because people are saying that's not what I signed up for here, on time and on budget are totally irrelevant if we haven't got the people that are going to activate that project at the end. And I think that there's less and less tolerance for that way of operating. And I think it's hard. Like there's some people who really have held on to that because that's what they've been rewarded for all the way through their career that, you know, you continue to deliver, you're outstanding, you do long hours, you go above and beyond, all of those things, there might be a certain time when we've got to dig deep and roll up our sleeves and we are doing crazy hours and we are just really focused on a deliverable. But it can, I don't believe it can ever be at the expense of that relationship. It has to be going together. So that's why, you know, the, the whole concept of psychological safety gets such uh, such a a big role in our organisations now that if we haven't set up an environment where people can provide feedback, can offer an opinion, can have a difficult conversation without fear of repercussions, then again, we're just focusing on delivering a task without actually getting an outcome which is sustainable and will be embedded into the organisation moving forward. Yeah, and that brings up a... I guess the, the technology aspect, we've talked about being human and connecting with people, yet there's such a trend to implement, especially in uh, reporting processes and dashboards and all this technology that's tracking metrics. How do we take the best parts of you know, 
analytics and metrics tracking, use them to be more human focused? Yeah, look, I think that's really interesting, uh, just even watching, obviously, the the rise of AI, and I feel like every day it's going to be, and we've done this, and we've done that, and do we really need humans to add that human flavour to that report to do the analysis? You know, chat GPT can do that easily, et cetera, and there's a bit of an argument going both ways. I fundamentally believe that the the human element of looking at that data, understanding that report, you need to apply it to case in point, to our organisation, to our team, to what we see happening based on our culture, based on our narrative, based on where we're at in in a particular um, program of work or or a change activity. We absolutely need to embrace. It's not going away. So those who are hoping that AI is just going to drift off in the background, I, I think that's probably... Um, it, I don't think that's a useful mindset uh, because it's here. So how do we work with it? So we we get curious about it. We try and understand how that can help us, how it can save us time, how it can add some richness that we just haven't had time to access or we don't know how to access that new, you know, that new content or, or something from that perspective. But then how, how do we partner with it essentially because it's going to be here anyway. So we might as well work out how we're going to add our value. And I think our value is that it is that interpretation and application to the environment, which only we can see, sense and feel. AI or ChatGPT, if I put in a question, it doesn't know that there's, you know, that the age force might be, um, sorry, the workforce might be aging, or you might have an issue with diversity or the fact that the, um, you know, the, the industry is is a dying industry. I can put all that information into a search engine, but it's not going to customise it for what's happening to the human at that particular time. It's going to give me good, solid, largely factual information. And information is power, there's no doubt, but the application of it is where the real value and the wisdom comes from. So I think that we have to continually be human with our technology we can't outrun it. Don't even try. You will be exhausted. So find out how you can jump on board and partner with it to really to give us back some time. We know we work too long. We know that we spend too much time, you know, worried about the things that we can't solve. Let the technology do some of the heavy lifting for us. It's built that way. And the fact is it's better at it. So let us be great at what we're great at and let the technology be great at what it's great at. And I, I only see an upside actually. Yeah, I, I I do as well. I tend to be more biased toward pro, our pro technology, uh, yeah. but it is I I my approach is it is a tool, and like any tool, you need to know how to use that tool, and it is not an entity in its own. It is a tool that humans use at this point anyway until they fully take over. The world. <laughs> um, we haven't hit. Uh, the matrix yet, but, uh, but yeah, I, I was just at a coaching event the other day and it was fascinating to hear people's perceptions on, we were talking about AI and the, the workplace and AI and coaching. And there was this polar opposition. Some people are like, bring on the AI overlords. I'm ready. And this is amazing. And other people are like, I'm scared, petrified of it. I won't even look at it. And then, of course, you have people in the middle, but to, to just hear this, and these are top level coaches and business people, and there's still this diametrically opposed viewpoint. It's interesting, isn't it? I was uh, just reading in the Australian Financial Review, the AFR here this morning uh, in Australia, that there is a significant shift in terms of the use of consultants. Um, and part of that's being driven by the fact that we can access technology. Organisations can access technology more readily to solve some of the more complex problems. But the shift in terms of also that reliance on bringing in expertise to solve what really a lot of people could solve if they uh, had more more resources. So often, you know, it's we need more people, more brains to solve this problem because it's too big whilst we're whilst the organisation is focusing on, you know, either BAU or the plant or the strategy moving forward. 
technology is similar. We've been using, you know, the consultants forever. And this article indicates that across the big four, you know, PwC, Deloitte, uh, you know, looking at McKinsey, other areas and how they're reducing their numbers uh, and it's creating a fear in the industry. But those who are being clever about it are recognising that, one, the economic situation that many industries are in at the moment just actually means people need to make some choices about which projects will slow down, which ones we um, just simply cannot afford to do at this stage and therefore we're not going to invest in the in the money with the consultants. But it's also because that industry is absolutely being exposed to change. Like there have been, uh, I guess several of them have been um, investigated as to maybe not operating to the level of uh, the way we would quite like them to be behaving in terms of some of the decisions or some of the ways they've gone about their work, and they've been held accountable. And so that industry is changing in terms of the expectation of how they behave. But the other thing that's happening in that industry is that technology is replacing some of the work that they have traditionally done. So how does that organisation adapt really quite rapidly? And I think that when you talk about it from the diversity of people's viewpoint of I don't even want to look at it through bring it on, we're seeing it happen in real time right now. Those who are saying I don't want to even look at it, they are the ones I believe who will just get left behind. They will get stuck or they're probably already stuck and they can't take that step forward. To be the pioneer, you know, at the bleeding edge, well done, be brave. Someone's got to be out the front and I'm happy to watch, <laughs> take a few steps back from there and then learn from you. And I think that that's, that's what I say. We're seeing that in real time, that the the, the management consultants of, of maybe even just a, a decade ago, they have to redesign themselves because technology is replacing a lot of what they could have done and what they were being engaged to do. There's a lot of brilliant minds that can be utilised. It's just the how. And if we're not looking at that partnering with technology, then I think that, you know, that increases the likelihood of irrelevance for those individuals and those firms. Agreed. Yeah, there's over the past few years, the pace of change has just been off the charts. And yeah, there I still see companies with their head in the sand saying, let's just go back to how it was. And yeah that's not going to happen and mm -hmm. it's the awareness is out there right now in terms of all these changes happening from a from a skill standpoint for leadership and, and even employees you had mentioned the ability to adapt as being one of the the key skills i guess we'll we'll call it what outside of that what other skills are I guess the top ones from a change ambiguity standpoint that are going to be most valuable. Mm, absolutely. So creativity, which is thinking differently to solve modern, unforeseen, wicked problems. So how are we going to explore different avenues? Curiosity. I actually think there's a profound lack of, lack of curiosity as we move further up the tree in an organisation because there's this perception that we're supposed to know, supposed to have the answers. If anything, the curiosity should increase. Asking great open what-if questions or imagine-if type questions, I think they they invoke such wonderful conversations. But also the to, to let go of the past, you've just said it there, we're not going back. So those who are ruminating and wishing and holding on to it, that's a real hindrance to people being able to take that first step forward. And so to recognise and respect and love the past, learn from it, and then recognise that we're in a different place. So I would say it is around that curiosity, that creativity, being flexible in your thinking. How are you going to look at this perspective or take in a different perspective? Even the, the simple skill of entering into a debate where you absolutely believe black is black, white is white, but you take the contrary view because it's a skill. It develops that skill set about if I really had to argue that that black was actually a shade of grey, how would I go about doing that? And that actually keeps the brain active and we can do things from a different perspective. There's also the concept of being really quite focused and being able to work out, I'm just going to do X, Y, and Z 
for the next couple of hours, which is around that clarity piece. And then I'll deal with what comes after that later. But not getting stuck and washed over with all that ambiguity is critical because it's not going away. So inform yourself, ask a few questions, and that might give you a pathway forward. Love that. Yeah. And and that speaks quite a bit to matrix organizations where you're you're, uh, spinning up project teams from diverse uh, people around the company that might not have a background in a certain area, but they bring in new perspective and creativity. And then as that project wraps up, those people get distributed to other projects in the organization. And when we look at the, the, I guess, the change over the five years or 10 years, when half the jobs that we have now might not even be in existence Mm -hmm. anymore. And who, like 10, 15, 20 years ago, who would have thought things like um, AI prompt writers would be a in-demand skill and Back in the day, social media managers, and that wasn't a skill that existed 25 years ago. And we're going to have those things now. So when we look at how leaders can really help their teams and and especially senior leaders help the organizations set themselves up for success, I love how you're saying that embracing the ambiguity, but also being having that creative outlet, the the ability to ask those questions and and not know, know you don't know the answers and be okay with that. Mm. It's it's really, it's actually really wonderful to uh, taking on that mindset of exploration and experimenting. It doesn't, we don't have to allocate a massive budget or a massive time frame to it. It's just the what if we tried it this way? What might be able to happen? What learnings could we take on? As you mentioned, getting it, accessing your diverse network. There are so many wonderful views and opinions and um, wisdom out there that maybe I have a different job title or maybe I have a different background, but that might be the richness that I can actually add. And I think that there is, for me, when uh, working with organisations that are saying, oh, I just I don't know if I've got the energy to go again, like I've just come through this massive change, et cetera, and energy is a really important component of being able to build resilience and and sticking and moving forward. It's pretty easy to remind people about what they've already achieved, and it's quite marvellous when people just look back even maybe a year or two ago, what was happening then that you didn't think, you know, you'd be able to get to this point now? People are extraordinary, what they can do, what they've got capacity to do, what they have done. And we get so busy, we race past it. We don't actually reflect and think that was pretty remarkable that I managed to do that. I didn't think I was going to be able to form into this new team or relocate into this new state or this new way of working, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't think I'd get curious about technology. And then they they can reflect on that and and even reward themselves by saying, well done, I did that and now what's the next thing I'm going to do? Because we are resilient and we can do a lot of fabulous things. It's just we're built initially to run from the change, run from the ambiguity. If we can take that breath and slow ourselves down and go, okay, I've seen this before. I know I don't initially like it, but I'll get curious about it, try and resolve what I can, give us a bit of clarity and then I can start to move forward because we can do it and we've been doing it for our entire life. You've just talk, described the growth mindset. Yes, you're it's right, actually. actually. Yes. Being able to be like, yeah, this is a new chance to learn and grow. And so when, how long do you think it'll be till we see our first chief ambiguity officer? Oh, I love that question. Do you know, I've never had that question and nor have I thought about it. You know, well, I don't know. So we have our chief transformation office officers, obviously, who are transforming an organisation, but often with a very um, detailed plan. I don't know. I think we, I think we might need one. I mean, because we have chief happiness officers, which I love, and we have, you know, obviously our chief culture. And they're all a part of it, aren't they? But it is about, you know, seeing that the ambiguity is honestly the advantage. We actually run a program called the Ambiguity Advantage 
And it's for exactly that, that if you are the organisation, if you're the leader that chooses to look at ambiguity from a, a, as an advantage to you, then off you go because others are looking at it as being overwhelmed and stuck and fearful. And that's okay because that's how we tend to all respond initially, but we can make a choice to do it differently. And that's the education that we like to help people with in our work. How can you learn to embrace ambiguity? So firstly, complete the assessment, find out where you currently are at. Data is always useful. And then let's take you through the program, which looks at the skills that you need to develop your tolerance levels with the overall objective of looking at ambiguity as an advantage and opportunity rich. Wonderful. And and so where can people find you? Where can people take that uh, that test? Or so they survey? can uh, find me, uh, Karen Vuster, um, on LinkedIn. And I have got two companies that provide a bit of an overview in both areas. One is Change 2020. And the second one, which is where we do a lot of our work with ambiguity, is called Adaptic Minds. So it's Adapt IQ Minds. And so you can find us on LinkedIn, and I'd love to chat to anyone about it. Perfect. I will make sure those links are up on the show notes. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insight and uh, perspective. And I loved, loved having you on the show. That wraps up another episode of the Working Well podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Which guests or topics would you like to see featured on the show? Message me through LinkedIn or on the contact page of timboris.com. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Tim Boris with Fresh Group and look forward to seeing you on the next episode.